Good evening, everyone. I'm Susan Hockfield, President Emerit of MIT and a member of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. And it's a great pleasure this evening to be the host of a conversation about cancer research at MIT, about the past, about the present, and about the future. Um, as you all know, MIT is very well known for innovations, for discoveries, and turning those discoveries into applications. But MIT is also well known for incredible innovations in organization. And this evening, we're gonna have a chance to talk about how MIT has organized itself around cancer research and cancer applications. And it's a fascinating history. As part of our celebration of the 10th anniversary of the MIT uh, Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research, and it's hard for me actually to realize that it's been a full 10 years since we launched this, Tyler and me and a bunch of people together. I wish we'd be sharing this evening with you in person, but I would say better to be virtual than not at all. So we have a fantastic panel this evening for remarkable scientists who each has provided visionary leadership of MIT's cancer-related efforts. First, as the Center for Cancer Research, which was the predecessor to the Koch Institute. And these four wonderful leaders will give us an inside look into how MIT invented and reinvented novel organizations to accelerate progress against cancer. So to get started, I'm gonna let each of them introduce themselves. They're gonna tell us when and how you came to MIT and uh, perhaps share with us at least one highlight of, in their mind of MIT's uh, work in cancer, both in the Center for Cancer Research and then in the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. And I think we'll start in the past and work our way forward. And I would invite Phil and uh, Richard to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the genesis of cancer research at MIT. So I, I came to MIT in 1974. At the time uh, I was recruited here, uh, I was at Cold Spring Harbor where I had been for three years and begun to study DNA tumor viruses and identify genes in uh, DNA viruses that cause cancer. And uh, what attracted me to the, the new Center for Cancer Research, which was directed by Salvador Luria. He had gotten a Nobel Prize in 69, five years before I was recruited, was this whole new structure of the Cancer Center with uh, Dave Baltimore as one of the leaders, Phil Robbins uh, as a professor, one of the leaders, and Herman Eisen, but particularly Dave Baltimore, who was a molecular virologist who had just discovered reverse transcriptase and was a leader in the scientific community in the country in molecular approaches to cell biology. And uh, at the time, I was interested in how genes could be expressed to cause cancer and what genes were particularly involved in that in, in viruses. And so being in the vicinity of Dave Baltimore down the hall on the fifth floor uh, with young colleagues uh, throughout the, the cancer center just uh, to me appeared to be just the ideal situation to become uh, a, involved in cancer research. So I, I waited a year for the call from MIT, just hoping I would get uh, an interest from them. And, and I did, and it, it was clearly one of the, the best decisions I've ever made. Richard, how about you? Tell us who you are and uh, how you came to join the cancer effort here. Well, I, I was at MIT as a graduate student earlier in the 60s. And I knew Salva and David Baltimore during that time. And it was a wonderful time to be at MIT. I came here from the UK because it was a place to do work on high eukaryotic organisms, which was not widely done at that time in molecular biochemical situations. And it was being done here, one of the earliest places to take that on. So that's why I came here, and it was fantastic. It was just a trip the whole five years I was here. And I went back to England as had been my plan and went to the ICRF, Imperial Cancer Research Fund. It was a while ago, one could still call things Imperial. <laughs> um, it became one of the founding institutions that's now part of the Crick Institute. 
and was a great place to do cancer research. So I was lucky again to be in the right place at the right time. And I was planning to stay in England. And then I got approached initially by Salva and later by David. Um, they were talking about opening a cancer center. Would I be interested in interviewing? And I said, sure, because I missed MIT. So I, I was interviewed and, uh, and came in the same cohort as Phil and I had the same experience he just enunciated. Susan asked us to tell a story that sort of illustrates the culture of the cancer center as it then was. We had an annual, still do, an annual retreat off-site. And at one of those retreats, which was around 1990, I don't know exactly which year, several groups in the cancer center were beginning to try to make knockout mice and all having difficulty, challenges. And so the postdocs, among whom was Tyler at that point, pulled together a, a, an ESL club to jointly work out how to get this to work. And it was, as you probably know, a huge success. And this became one of the places beginning early on to apply knockout mouse technology to cancer. Tyler being a prime example, and there were other groups, ours included, doing that. And it became one of the signature things. And it's characteristic of the way the Cancer Center and now the Koch Institute work, enormously collaborative. So what did we start out by doing? David and Salva were visionary in the way they set this place up. It really was built to foster collaboration. All the facilities were shared. One shared other people's laboratory stuff all the time. We had this annual retreat and they set this up with three separate divisions, but they weren't really separate. One of them was animal virology in which Phil was a, a prime member led by David Baltimore. And when I was talking to Salva about possibly coming back, he said, we need developmental biology. I was a developmental biologist as a student. We should come and interview. So one of the divisions was cell and developmental biology, um, headed by Phil Robbins, who was a carbohydrate biochemist. I was in that group. So was David Hausman, who was working on stem cells and hematopoiesis, and a number of other people. I won't go through, take the time to go through all the names. And then the third division was immunology. Uh, led by Herman Eisen, who was a stellar immunologist and a great guy. And there were uh, other immunologists in there. And that was very, it was a seminal choice to include those things. And you can see the reflections of that down through the history of the center. You know, the, the, the molecular biology and the animal virology at the time when it was started, it wasn't easy to work on cells. That was a while ago and people worked on viruses because it wasn't so easy. And then molecular biology came along and one could apply those same technologies initially to cells and then to animals, as I said before. So that led to basically a merger of the animal virology and the cell biology divisions. They became continuous. Immunology was also key in the sense that it started immunology here, never a huge part of the center, but a very powerful part of the center where things such as MS MHC restriction were, some of the leading work was done here by Mike Bevan. And there are things which uh, Herman Eisen developed, which are still now being used in the field of immunotherapy. Me methods and reagents and mice and things like that that came out of that immunology thrust and is now a major part of the activities of the, of the Coke. So they were visionary in the way they set that up. They were also visionary in the way they fostered collaboration and openness and respect for different sorts of science. So we all listened to what each of us was doing all the time. Most of the group meetings were joint group meetings among several groups. The annual retreat led all of us to get together and share ideas. And that was key to 
moving with the times, and taking up new things as they showed up. This was a great place. We were plugged into the pipeline. We heard about things early, and we put them into operation. So I think I won't take any more time. I'll hand over to Ty. Uh, thanks, Richard. So <clears throat> you asked sort of, how did we get here? How did you come to MIT? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in some respects, it was sort of written in my DNA because my father was an MIT faculty member, so I sort of saw it coming. But I also got attracted to come to MIT as a postdoc, and, and Richard actually referenced that time. Joined Bob Weinberg's lab, had been in the Center for Cancer Research, but was in the White at that point. So I had my training at MIT, and I got to observe the Center for Cancer Research close at hand. Um, we had joint group meetings at that time, which included Phil's lab and several other labs as part of the Cancer Center, David Hausman and others. Uh, and I got to know the Cancer Center faculty very well, including these two gentlemen, but many other people, Nancy Hopkins and many other people, and had tremendous respect. So when it became time for me to decide where to take my first position, it was frankly quite obvious. If I could convince them that I would be worthy addition to the faculty, I was certainly gonna go. And, and it was really about two qualities and, and they both mentioned them. The first was a respect for basic science, the science of cancer, which we were committed to pursuing as well. And also the embracing of technology and technology development, which has always been a thread that ran through that institution and frankly runs through the institution uh, that is the Koch Institute. So those were the things that attracted me to come. And obviously now almost 30 years later, I'm very happy that I did. Um, you asked us to mention a particular noteworthy moment. Um, for me, the thing that came to mind was something that happened about 40 feet from here, just outside of the Coke Cafe. As I was thinking about a problem that we had in the lab, trying to figure out a way in which we could capture cancer cells circulating in the blood of mice. We knew they were there, but there in small numbers. It was gonna be hard to do with conventional methods. So I was musing about this and I bumped into Scott Manalis, one of our engineering colleagues. And he asked what was up and I said, well, this is on my mind. And I explained what I needed to do. It was very challenging actually from a technical perspective. And he turned around and said, I think we can do that. <laughs> and within a few weeks in, in part in collaboration with Matt's lab, um, the plans were laid and eventually the devices were built and we were able to do exactly what we'd hoped to be able to do. And it frankly wouldn't have happened except for a place like this and the kind of culture of sharing and thinking together and collaborating that we've tried to foster here. So uh, it's been a wonderful ride so far. Matt, Great. Our, um, our, our youngster. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I've only been at MIT for a little more than 10 years. And I guess to tell you the story how I got here, you know, I had a little different path. I really had nothing to do with MIT before I ended up here. I trained as a physician scientist. And, you know, along the way, I sort of developed this love of basic biology. And really, my whole career, I've really wrestled with this, you know, training and desire to want to take care of patients while at the same time understanding that there's things we just don't understand. And if we don't understand them better, there won't be the new solutions for the future. You know, and along my training, I got very interested in this question of how metabolism works and how it works in cancer. And that's a very old question. And it really came to a head when I was going through my oncology fellowship, because I knew we were doing all these tests based on the different metabolism that patients had, but there was really nothing we were doing about treating them. And I sort of had in my mind a vision, well, you know, here's an old problem that hasn't been studied in a long time, hasn't been thought about in a long time, but there's all this new technology and new approaches that could be brought to bear. Better model systems, better ways to analyze the genetics the biochemistry of the tumors. And I had this idea that maybe I could build a research program that would allow me to study this. And as I was going through my postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School and really contemplating how best to do this, I actually remember this very distinctly. I got a call from a competing institution that basically suggested I go on the job market. And I was like, oh, am I ready? Yeah, I guess maybe, sure. And I was talking to some colleagues and ultimately this percolated through the grapevine and then I got a phone call from Phil Sharp. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's Phil Sharp who's calling me. <laughs> Phil says, have you heard about the Koch Institute? And I did a little, 
looking into this and you know in the end I was fortunate enough to be offered a job here as well as other places and I decided to follow what at the time was quite an unconventional path to a physician scientist. The typical thing most people like me did is that they would go to a medical school and you know it makes a lot of sense right you want to take care of patients you want to do research have the labs near each other and you know I had this idea that well if I came to MIT I'd really be in a position to do something different I'd have all the amazing mouse models that Tyler developed I'd have the incredible technology access to these engineers who are doing things that just didn't exist in the world that I had grown up in and so you know for me that was really exciting I decided to take what felt a little bit like a risk at the time. And, you know, many of my physician scientist colleagues pointed this out to me and thought it was a little bit odd for making the choice. But, you know, looking back on it, it was clearly the right choice for me. I think coming to a place like MIT where I had people who thought quantitatively, people who thought differently, the collaboration, the multidisciplinary approach, I think it really allowed us to do things in my lab that we never would have done before. And I've had the pleasure to work with just amazing colleagues who I think have really changed how I think about many, many problems. You know, it's hard to pinpoint one sort of seminal event, but you know, the thing that Tyler mentioned, that happened multiple times. I'd walk into one of my engineering colleagues' office and they would say, oh, maybe we can do this. And I actually got to think about something in a different way. Sometimes they would say, we can do this. How is this useful? And that was a lot of fun to think about, especially for someone who had some clinical training, how one might be able to take novel technology and think about, oh, how that could be applicable in a, you know, in a clinical setting. And it's been an amazing ride. I'm incredibly honored to be on the same panel as, you know, honestly, some of my heroes growing up as a scientist. And it's really great to be here today. That's great. So we're gonna come back to many of these topics, but I um, neglected to tell the audience uh, we will be getting to your questions you know, toward the end of the program, but if you have questions, enter them into the Q&A function on your Zoom screen, and um, we'll get to as many of them as we can um, after some further conversation. Now, a couple of themes came up, these themes that um, you know, we all know to be signature of, of these cancer activities, both the Center for Cancer Research, and I'm still learning about it, and the Koch Institute. And there is a, um, some magic uh, in fostering collaborations and fostering unexpected convergences of ideas and disciplines. <clears throat> and I want to talk a little bit about how um, that happens, but each of you called this out in what drew you into this crazy mix of, uh, of people, but all focused on cancer. Uh, a couple other themes that I hope we get back to. One is this question of how do you study cancer without patients? So how do you make an impact against cancer as a disease? if we're, oh, what, a five or 10 minute walk from the nearest academic medical center, not forever away, but still not, not on our campus. And the other is, um, you know, uh, not just here in the Coke or in the Center for Cancer Research, but across MIT, we are known for taking discoveries into the marketplace. And many places have a problem with, it. there's a tension, and yet MIT has managed to navigate it. And even more importantly, among biologists, it is not a common <laughs> route to go. And yet we have fostered that kind of engagement with, um, let's just say the real world, the commercial world in ways that I think are pretty unique. So I wanna come back to that, that too. Um, but let's just talk for a minute about, cover the past. Oh, I know one other thing. We weren't explicit about your role. So each of you has been the director of the Center for Cancer Research, or the Koch Institute, so we can divide the four in half. We've got Koch Institute people next to me and the more distant our senior wise men here from the uh, Center for Cancer Research. Um, and that's um, part of why they're with me on this panel. So we talked about the deep history of the Center for Cancer Research and Phil and Richard described some of the things about that that were um, unique and drew them here. But now I wanna to turn to um, the first 10 years of the Koch Institute. And for this, I wanna start with Tyler and uh, have him describe how we invented, he invented, 
we all whole population invented the next chapter for MIT's cancer research. Um, and um, Tyler, if you can explain, you know, for the audience, the thesis behind this, I would say, um, evolution of the Center for Cancer Research into the Koch Institute. It's not exactly a pivot. It's not exactly, a, you know, a new direction, but it is um, an evolution. And describe that a little bit and why the Koch Institute is uh, different from most other cancer centers anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, certainly I don't deserve the credit. It was uh, the product of lots of people's efforts over a long period of time. In fact, Richard, when he was director, began embracing colleagues from the School of Engineering into the Center for Cancer Research membership. So we had people like Doug Laufenberger and Bob Langer as members of the Cancer Center well before I became director. And so that began a trend for us at MIT to reach out beyond the more conventional descriptions of who is a cancer research to, to include people who are coming at the problem from different perspectives. And as you know, Susan, the cancer, the Institute was changing significantly in that direction across the life sciences, not just in cancer. Many of our engineering colleagues, maybe a full third of our engineering colleagues were starting to think about problems in the life sciences from their perspective, whether it be through quantitative measures or through new technologies or what have you. And so it became natural to begin to expand the scope, expand the tent of what is cancer research at MIT. So as part of that process, we began to add more and more members from engineering. It seemed appropriate that at an institution such as ours with such strengths across the board, we would look different from a cancer center somewhere else. And then two forces converged or perhaps three forces converged that led to the transition to the Koch Institute in the building in which we're sitting. The first is the old cancer center building began to fall apart around us. Uh, and frankly, it was clear that we need to do something. Uh, if, if nothing else, we would build a, a replacement facility for that institution. It was a great building. It was a great building in many ways, but it was in fact falling apart. Um, the second important force was that Susan Hockfield arrived on the campus and she began to hear about this opportunity for interaction between the schools of engineering and school, the school of science. And I think focused in on the opportunity in cancer in particular. And so in a discussion with her that a, a center head might have with any cancer, with any uh, university president, we need a new building. She said, sure, sure. Tell me more about what you have in mind. And I explained science and engineering. She said, you don't just need a new building. You need a new building that's twice as big as the one you thought. <laughs> which is something you never hear. And um, that, that was critical. Susan put her weight, her muscle and fundraising behind what we needed to do. And our colleagues in, in, in engineering whom we reached out to to join us were likewise extremely enthusiastic. And then of course, David Koch came and provided the funding necessary to allow us to do that. And frankly, inspired the institution to do it as fast as possible and said, I, I'll give you a gift only if you commit to finishing the planning in a hurry and building the building in a hurry. So he deserves a tremendous amount of credit for getting us to where we are today. And I think just to finish, I think the building of an institution devoted to this interface of science and engineering with the investment of resources, a building, the space required to build it and, and all that goes into that, um, I believe is unique in this country. I don't think there's another cancer center that has that flavor of of uh, interdisciplinarity that we have here. And it's been recognized by the National Cancer Institute. We have a core grant from the National Cancer Institute for one of 65 or so cancer centers in the country. We're the only one that looks like this. And the last two times that we've been reviewed by the National Cancer Institute, we've gotten a perfect score. So they clearly think that what we've done here is worthy of investment. It's an amazing story, Tyler. And, and I just have to add, kind of from my perspective, Tyler comes to me, and everyone came to me with a promissory note from my predecessor, Chuck Best, who's a great president, but saying, your predecessor promised me X, and I'm, you know, are you gonna deliver that? <laughs> <laughs> and Tyler described this, you know, that well, I asked what was going on, he described um, the biology and the, you know, engineering coming involved, and they've you've gotten two grants explicitly to explore the interaction of engineering with biology for cancer. 
<clears throat> but the building he described was only going to have biologists in it. So well, why would you do that? And he said, well, because it would have to be twice as large. <laughs> and so we, we did take it on. But it, it, it was a, an incredibly persuasive um, uh, pitch. And particularly because I'd already heard from Tom McNanty, who was dean of the School of Engineering, the great interest in using biological parts to build new technology. So it, it was, um, the timing was, was really great um, and fun, interesting. And we managed to, to, um, to get it done. And then you put together an extraordinary uh, program here. Two things um, I want to come back to. So we, you talked about federal funding. And we all know that that has been critical. Um, you can think about the Center for Cancer Research in the context of National Cancer Act, right? How did that happen? So how did MIT get into the cancer game? How much of that relied on federal funding that newly became available? And um, you, know, how, you know, how does a new field come to be in terms of funding for those activities? So briefly, um... Salvador Luria was a professor in the Department of Biology, but MIT had had a, a long history before that of working on human cells and culture, uh, doing virology. Uh, there was good evidence that cancer was caused by genes, but we really didn't know a lot about how those genes caused the actual disease of cancer. And knowing this foundation of really excellent science in the department, he uh, and the Institute uh, took advantage of the National Cancer Institute Act, the, the Nixon War on Cancer. And this year is the 50th anniversary of, of that uh, act. And uh, applied for uh, funds to fund a basic science center. And the Sealy Button Foundation uh, stepped in and uh, was charitable in making a gift to uh, finish the building. So they took a chocolate factory right on the edge of campus, a very stable building, but, but a chocolate factory emptied the floors and developed this expansion of the Department of Biology. And it really created the, the future of the department in terms of addressing diseases like cancer and other immune diseases. And even neuroscience grew out of the Cancer Center as part of uh, the activity. There was uh, three Nobel Prizes in the building, the Laureus. They, Baltimore, got a Nobel Prize one year after the, the center was opened in 1975. So Sumo Tawagawa got a Nobel Prize about 10 years later. Uh, I got a Nobel Prize uh, about 10 years after that. So it, it, it was an extraordinarily powerful uh, step forward in, in the, the biology community and MIT uh, as an institute. Um, let me actually stick with funding for a little a uh, little bit. We talked about David Koch's critical role in uh, making the Koch Institute uh, exist and what it is today. Um, and for you know, um, you know, once you're in the inside of a university, <laughs> you understand how the dollars work. Uh, the role of not just federal funding, which is you know irreplaceable, but of private philanthropy. It's a little bit different. And Tyler, you were really an expert in using those different sources of funding in, in different ways, kind of, you know, uh, you know, activities made for a particular kind of funding. Why don't you talk a little bit sure. about what, what private philanthropy allowed us to do? And Richard, too, but go ahead. Well, I would just highlight, first of all, I agree with you, the importance of philanthropic funding donors who care about the cause and want to make a difference and, and make a difference differently, frankly. The funding that we get from the government is critically important, but it tends to be very prescribed and have uh, you know, an expectation that doesn't give one as much flexibility and freedom to explore as we would like to, and, and frankly, we can do with other sources of funding. So I would say there are two 
among many that I would call out. One is a new center that we have in nanotechnology supported by Kurt and Kathy Marble. And that's brought together a series of our colleagues who are experts in material science and nanotechnology and applying those tools to better understand the disease, diagnose the disease, monitor the disease uh, in new and very powerful ways. And that wouldn't have been possible were it not for that foundational gift from the marbles. Another is the, the formation of the so-called Bridge Project, the program that we have that brings us together with the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center across the river, and thus the name the Bridge Project, that is fully philanthropically funded by a series of donors, um, many of whom are inspired by the notion that bringing MIT and Harvard together around the problems of cancer is particularly powerful, and we agree. And again, all the dollars come from, from donors, and we take on the most ambitious, uh, sometimes very high risk, but very high reward projects that are otherwise challenging to fund through the more conventional sources. Yeah, Richard, you had a, something to say about, about funding. Yeah. Is it on? Yes, it is. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention, going back a little earlier, um, late 80s, Howard Hughes started putting money into oh. places like MIT, and a number of people were appointed here. And they also gave us a lot of money for facilities. We have money for facilities from the core grant. At the time in the 90s, we also got a lot of money from Hughes to set up some of our key facilities and e equip them. Those have now blossomed even further, but they really made it possible to start some of those things. So foundational support like that, and that's not foundation exactly, but that sort of support. Also, when Phil was director, he began to uh, engage industry in funding. Uh, you may want to add a word. No, I mean, it, it was Bristol Myers, it was Merck, it was Amgen. Uh, but uh, we have had always had relationships with the industry because it was a learn learn situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's wonderful to make a discovery. It's even more wonderful if you can see that discovery change the lives of people. And therefore, the whole translation of our science into benefit of society is uh, really, we semi committed it here. We promoted it. And now with our engineering colleagues, it's an extraordinarily powerful community that way. Yeah, so two great topics. Uh, let's first talk about disease. Matt, I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about how we study cancer without patients. And uh, Tyler mentioned the bridge project, which is you know one of our ways of building those bridges. Um, but as a physician, we, there are other physicians in the building too, uh, physician scientists. Yeah, I mean, how, how do you compare, contrast, or resolve actually being not in a hospital? I mean, I think physician scientists want to be here because they recognize that some of the solutions and directions we can do here are just different, right? We we can take different kinds of approaches that don't necessarily fit into the buckets that fit within hospitals. And also we have the ability to work with many different clinical partners, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, you know, look, there's many fabulous hospitals in town and other places around the world. And, you know, of course they provide great care, but they have a mission of providing patient care and they layer on top of that research. We can focus only on research. What is our right approaches, what are the different solutions we might be able to bring, and then we can go out and look for the right clinical partner to really work with us. And I think, you know, and I think it's a powerful model that really builds off of sort of the vision that underlies what Tyler described earlier, and that is, let's bring many different approaches together and try to think differently about solving different problems in cancer detection, cancer therapy, all the different pieces that are necessary to improve patients' lives, but then we can go work with who the right clinical partners are, be they through bridge projects or other things, to really bring those solutions out there. And oftentimes, as Phil alluded to, this involves working with industry, right? Understandably, it can be difficult if you're a hospital and you're selling the product of a pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. there's natural conflicts that arise, and of course, one has to be careful about that. 
And of course, we need to be thoughtful about similar sorts of conflicts. I'm by no means saying we don't, but but we sort of have this ability because we are our business model is not dependent on caring for patients and thus providing patients the product. Our business model is simply can we find new solutions and that gives us more freedom to work with industry, start companies, work with philanthropic organizations, work within traditional funding mechanisms to really try to do something different. And I think it puts us in a very unique position that is quite exciting. And I think it's why some people like me end up coming to the place. Yeah. So you mentioned, and Phil just mentioned, you know, our work with industry. And um, uh, there are many people, I don't know whether our audience are all from MIT and kind of understand the way we work in the marketplace, the way we, we work with industry. Um, and it is becoming more common, but um, MIT has been in this space going way back. And, you know, just, you know, your thoughts on how MIT has reconciled the possible conflicts of interest, um, how they've reconciled the, I would say, somewhat natural tension in the academy between theory and practice. Um, why does it work here? Um, MIT has been successful over decades and almost a century, this collaboration between mind and hand, discovery and benefit of society. Uh, because they've had a few rules. Uh, your primary obligation as a faculty member has to be to MIT, to MIT's research community, MIT's commitment in education. Uh, you can't be director of a firm or have a relationship with the private sector and take money into your own lab. So that breaks a conflict of interest, a conflict of commitment within the campus of MIT and the, the willingness to share information freely among people who are colleagues. And that, that's a big cultural issue. Uh, and then you can't be an executive in a company, therefore managing other people, if you're going to be a faculty member at MIT. So those were broad strokes. But with that, they fully recognize that if you're going to have an impact and benefit people, you have to be engaged with organizations that then translate insights into discoveries. And that came you know, way back with the core of the computer and, and, and you know, hardware, software, the IT industry. It was, it's just been something MIT has done over, over centuries. And it's now at a stage in this country that much of the fundamental advances that create really important aspects of society, all the way from medicine to IT, or a product of research that is stimulated on campus and then move off. So it's, it's the sustaining seed corn of our economy uh, in the country. Yeah, Phil has a, um, uh, describes it beautifully and he has been one of the uh, nations and world's leader in naturally navigating this frontier. Um, and a, a, a phrase you have that I quote all the time, is that technology travels on two feet. And so we are um, you know, very um, uh, fortunately placed, our physical location, all of MIT, but particularly uh, the Koch Institute at the apex of our, our injection into Kendall Square. <laughs> so it makes it pretty easy for people to walk out our door and walk into the door of a collaborating company. Yeah, you know, it's no accident, Susan, that when we designed the building, there's a mural on the floor in the front lobby that shows the positioning of the Koch Institute at the center of two spheres, namely MIT on the one hand and that ecosystem of Kendall Square on the other. Yeah. And the ability to walk between those two is critically important. Yeah. I think to Phil's point, you know, we've seen this, this evolution from, especially in the life sciences, but more broadly, you know, institutions allowing this sort of behavior, translation out to industry to encouraging it and embracing it. And that's sort of the attitude that we have here. We wanna facilitate in every instance, the opportunity to take ideas and new discoveries in the laboratory and bring them as rapidly um, into a position where they can be translated to the benefit 
of patients, which is a very expensive thing to do and requires the private investment that that process allows. Yeah, because we got started a little late, I'm eager uh, that we give Matt a chance as the future uh, of the Koch Institute and our big cancer efforts are in Matt's hands. And I thought we'd give him a few minutes to give us a sense of now you've been in the seat, how long? Four minutes? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe six minutes. Okay. Um, but um, I'm certainly you've talked to a lot of people and give us a sense of where you see the next chapter of our cancer activities at MIT going. Yeah, so, so it's a great question, Susan, and it's one I get a lot. And you know, I think the first thing to say is, is that there's a lot of stuff we do well, and we definitely have to continue to do those things well, right? We have fabulous engineering, we have fabulous basic science, and we have to continue to do those things and recognize that the lessons of the past do apply to the future. There are approaches that we can take and things that we can continue to do that are leading to real change for, for patients. You know, it's interesting. You go back and sometimes the national, you know, celebrating the 50th year of the National Cancer Institute, we can go back and say, well, how have we done? And some, not the nihilist will say, well, we haven't cured, can't cure cancer. And I would actually come and say, you know, you look at the face of cancer today, it's very different today than it was 50 years ago. And what led to those differences? Well, the, those differences were led to partially because we have new drugs. We have ways to harness the immune system that were only, you know, imagined decades ago. But there's other advances too. We're better at supportive care. We're better at delivering drugs. We're better at detecting cancer. What do we study at the Koch Institute? Well, we want to improve cancer detection. We want to improve drug delivery. We want to harness the immune system to help treat cancer. We want to find other new solutions to, to treat cancer. And if we look back, like the history of cancer, how we've improved lives of patients is really what we're doing. And we have to continue to do those things well. But we also have to realize that we don't understand everything. And that means we have to remember that the engineering solutions of tomorrow are gonna to come from the basic discoveries of today. And that means we have to make sure that we continue to foster our basic understanding of cancer and leverage that to really build the right engineering solutions for the future, regardless of whether or not, how, which bucket they fall in from detection to, to uh, therapy. And then there's all kinds of new directions, some of which we invented here on the MIT campus, right? There's phenomenal advances in computing, machine learning, things that, you know, happened outside initially of the Koch Institute, but now the growing debate is how do we apply those to healthcare? How do we apply those to cancer research? Some of that work has been done by our faculty and will continue to be done by our faculty in places elsewhere. But I think we really have to challenge ourselves to think, well, what can we do that feels like science fiction? In fact, if you go back to the founding of the Center for Cancer Research, I'm sure some of the things that we do today feel would have sounded you know, fantastic if it could ever be accomplished. Well, we have to be bold enough to envision, well, how could we use machine learning and computer science to address the questions that are really hard ones to ask? We know cancer is a genetic disease, but we also know that the same individual who lives in two different places have different risks for cancer. That's not just genetics, those are things in the environment that are hard to imagine. Those are hard from a biologist to think of what's an individual hypothesis, but this is the power of computational approaches and in integrating data across systems. I think there's other opportunities out there. We've learned from the last several years, like, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic isn't quite at an end yet, but, you know, it's very different now than it was two years ago. Why? Because vaccine therapies advanced at startling pace. Maybe we could do that to change the pace of, you know, cancer therapy, cancer vaccines. That's an old idea. It's one that hasn't worked. But if we go back 20 years, people would have said immunotherapy couldn't have worked either. And now it's uh, one of the hottest topics in cancer biology. So I think for me, the future is, number one, recognizing that there are amazing things out there to discover that we may not even have thought of yet. So we have to give our faculty and have the 
the funding and the you know and the courage to explore the uncharted territory to find those next big discoveries, while at the same time making sure that we continue to build off of what we've done well and really chart some of these new directions because you know the the future is bright and I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for us. That's great. A couple of questions from um, the Q and A. Uh, on Zoom. Um, this is a big general question in, um, about the future. So what are the big open questions related to cancer biology, such as normal adult stem cells and cancer stem cells? Where are we? Where should we be? How are we thinking about it? <laughs> you want to go? Well, I think it's an interesting question that um, we're learning, we're continuing to learn about the importance of stem cell properties um, from our understanding of what normal, normal stem cells do and the programs that they use that are, we now know, co-opted in the development of cancer. Cancers evolve, and as they do, they acquire some properties that allow them to perpetuate and propagate. And among the things that happen are that they acquire these stem cell properties. And so from the point of view of therapy, one could argue that that's the cell state or the subtype of cell in the tumor that you really need to target. So thinking about how one does that and at the same time spares normal stem cells that are required for normal cellular turnover and regeneration. So these are some of the challenges that we face, but I think there's progress that's been made. There's a tremendous amount of interest here in this building. We have a stem cell initiative funded by philanthropic dollars, I'm pleased to say, um, that's directed at exactly that question. What are the properties of normal stem cells? How are they co-opted in cancer? And how can you design therapies that eliminate one without eliminating the other? Okay, sorry, I turned my mic on too soon. Um, what I would say about stem cells, fascinating subject, obviously, it's one of the things that I alluded to the thrust on developmental biology from the beginning. Stem cells don't operate by themselves. They operate in a tumor micro, in a stem cell microenvironment, as do tumors. And I think the progressive understanding of how the surrounding cells influence cancer cells, which has really moved tremendously in the last decade. Um, initially, when you think back to the beginning of the cancer center or the beginning of the cancer programs, cancer cells were viewed as operating by themselves. They, they don't, nor do stem cells. And it's becoming clear that stem cells are affected by environmental influences such as diet. And that's going to be really interesting. We know that diet affects cancer, but we really don't know how. And we're beginning to get some insights into how it affects stem cells and their proclivity towards going cancerous. So I think that's a really promising lead that we have in front of us, a challenge that we have in front of us, but an optimistic one. So we're coming to the end of our allotted time, and I just wanted to be sure to get this particular question in because it's near and dear to my, my heart. Um, I think um, either Matt or Tyler um, has said that um, you no longer think of people at the Koch Institute as biologists or engineers, but instead as people who have good ideas and ask big questions. <laughs> so you enter this place and somehow your identity gets lost. Um, but uh, you, the, the question is, how do you plan on a future um, that builds an organization or structures where there are no disciplinary labels? You know, this is a question that comes up a lot in a mm. lot of other academic places. Mm. Ask us this exact question, how do you guys pull this off? And I think, you know, I think the answer is simple, but for some reason has been hard for other people to get right in practice. And I think it, you don't tell people, well, you're an engineer, so you have to take this approach, and you're this scientist, so you have to take that approach. I think you mix people together and you say, here's a hard problem, go solve it. And that, I guess, in its beautiful simplicity is what those who have come before me have set up. And 
and it, you know, and it really is true. I think people who work here at the Pulse Institute, they don't think of themselves as labels. They think of themselves as just interested in the problem and trying to solve it. And why that is hard to do, I don't know, but I'm glad we got it right. And Susan, it is it is very much a product of the place. I think <clears throat> people do come with an orientation based on their training, and they are immersed in an environment where they are exposed to new thinking and new ideas, new perspective, new language, and it changes them. Uh, Sangeeta Bhatti is every much the molecular biologist as she is the engineer. Angie Belcher can go deep on every topic you could imagine. In, in part because of the native intelligence and training that she brings, but also because of the exposure, I think, from this place. Daryl Irvin tells this great story about his own training, where he started here as a PhD student in material science, and then he went to Stanford to learn immunology. Then he came back here to be a faculty member, then he joined our faculty inside the Coke, and he says, you know, I used to describe myself as a material scientist. Then I described myself as an immunologist. Now I don't know what to describe myself, and I don't care. <laughs> so, um, uh, as a um, someone responsible for an academic organization, um, I love new models. Actually, I always love new models, even as a scientist. And so, the model that has been established here, first in the Center for Cancer Research, which was multidisciplinary before we actually stated that it was into the Koch Institute with a future that will embrace other disciplines even more robustly uh, in your vision, Matt. Um, the question is, is this a model that is unique to MIT? Or is it a model or unique to cancer at MIT? Or is this a model that we could actually, well, we wouldn't export it, but the people could adopt and learn from what we've done here. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. We do export them. We train a lot of really good people. I was trying to avoid feedback, so. We do export it. This is a great place for training. And we send out lots of trainees. You go anywhere in this country and abroad in Europe. You'll find people who came out of MIT and very many of them who came out of the Cancer Center and the Koch Institute, and they're nucleating the same sorts of ideas. I, I, I want to go a little deeper. Um, we've described this community of seeking answers and, and independent of discipline, but there's a deeper issue at MIT, and I think it's important to recognize that we're a very much a meritocratic institution. And you can have an undergrad sitting in a seminar and raise their hand and they have a good idea and they are comfortable talking about it. People will reach out to them and engage them. And they can contribute very importantly to research problems and to you know the, the culture of the lab. So this meritocratic activity, this respect of individuals contributing as part of a team it is really, uh, it's in the bloodstream of this institute. And I think it's a much more important topic than, than most people give credit for. I, I agree entirely. And something that if we had more time, we would have uh, dug into more deeply. But it's we've talked about our research, we've talked about our tech transfer, talked a little bit about our teaching, but it really is this extraordinary mix of trainees to senior investigators and how we manage uh, to cultivate a, you know, we talk about not having labels, you know, an environment where there aren't labels in terms of your seniority and there are not labels in terms of, of your discipline. And I would simply say that among the most inspiring things I've seen here is the passion of our trainees for the thesis of the place. We, we have, potential donors come in, we introduce them to our trainees, because our trainees are as articulate and as passionate about the possibility for everyone's future that they're contributing to. And I think that's um, you know, part of the magic of, you know, certainly MIT, but taken to a, a, a higher level here. 
Um, so the time, the hour is later than we had planned. Um, and you know, we could do this conversation for another two days and I would not tire of it. I just so appreciate the insights and intelligence that the four of you have brought to this entity, um, but also to the conversation tonight. And I just can't thank you enough for all you've done to build a great new kind of institution here at MIT, but also for what you've given to the world. So thank you all very, very much. And Matt, good luck. <laughs>